word from Bill Kinnemont. Thank you, John. Uh, my experience of the last hour trying to go and pick up Nick, who I failed to pick up and then get here, was that the more dangerous than climate change is in fact the, uh, the traffic of Melbourne, particularly <laughs> on this side of Melbourne. However, I, I have, a, have managed to get here. The, um, having failed to pick up Nick, I was able to actually be here in time to hear his, um, what he had to say about the book and I, I thank Nick very much for those very kind words. I also want to thank um, two people who, uh, the two principal people involved in the book, and that's uh, uh, Bob Carter and, and John Spooner. John has been uh, a very long uh, communicant with me for probably four or five years. He phones up and we, we meet occasionally, but uh, he phones up asking questions and so forth. But he often says, or he often said, you know, you've written a book. He said, if you'd like to write another book, I'd be very happy to illustrate it. <laughs> and that was a bit of an incentive because I'm a bit of a fan of, uh, of John's uh, cartoons and uh, his work in the age. But it really wasn't enough of an incentive to, to get going. Uh, writing a book is a very difficult thing. But uh, uh, <coughs> last year then, uh, John came and said, uh, look, Bob Carter's interested in, in uh, doing something. Would you be interested in, in joining us? And I said, well, look, yeah, that's, that's fine because it takes the burden off me. I'm very happy to contribute what I know. I, my knowledge is not very, very wide, but uh, I'd be happy to contribute. I've written one book. It was very difficult, but there's, I've written lots of things since then. And uh, if I can get those into a book and to make sure that, uh, unlike a number of books on this, this subject where the science is not portrayed as it really is, uh, that would be a bit beneficial. So... Uh, that's what, how I got involved in it. I really thank Bob and John for the invitation to, to join them because the, uh, what's turned out in the book I think is, is really great. It's, I read it through, I didn't get the book until uh, last Friday night, uh, John delivered some around and uh, I've been through it and uh, I'm very surprised at actually how good it is. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly because of <laughs> probably Bob and, and, and John but uh, I'm happy that I've made some contribution. But uh, it was mentioned before that uh, I was previously the head of the National Climate Centre in Australia and I'm often asked, now, why do you take this perspective on climate? And uh, my response is actually fairly simple. So that it's, if you look at the science and you look at what's around you, clearly there's a, a difference, there's, there's, a, there's something wrong with the way the science is being presented by the IPCC and others. because. They, they explain the greenhouse effect. They say it's radiation from the earth is absorbed by these greenhouse gases, it warms the atmosphere, part goes through to, to space, but some is reflected to the earth and it keeps us warm. Now, I'm not sure whether I should invite you to, but I, let me invite you in, later in the evening when you're alone, go outside, and take your clothes off <laughs> and see whether the greenhouse gases will keep you warm. <laughs> they won't. It's been known for at least 50 years that the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere actually emit more radiation than they absorb. The atmosphere cools because of greenhouse gases. Now, we've known for a long time that people get lost out in the bush. The danger is they'll have cold overnight they won't be able to survive. Now, you go right back, I happened to read um, William Bly's diary not so long ago mm -hmm. and he was talking about he was sailing his boat across from the South Pacific across to Timor. One of the big problems that he had, he and his uh, fellow crewmen, was that you know, they're in a, a long boat out there exposed, <laughs> they're in the tropical waters but at night they got very cold. Now they were put in the boat with only the clothes they stood up in, to keep warm, they'd take their clothes off, drop them in the warm water, take them out, bring them out, and put them back on again, about every two hours. Now, the greenhouse gases don't keep us warm. Now, that doesn't mean to say there isn't a greenhouse effect. There is a greenhouse effect. And adding carbon dioxide will enhance the greenhouse effect. But it's not by the way that it's explained by the IPCC and all the people who they follow that, that logic. If you read Jim Flannery's book, he says, 
the greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide, absorbs a little bit of, uh, of the radiation and warms. The atmosphere warming means more uh, water vapour, itself a greenhouse gas, and so more uh, warming takes place. And so one would assume that there's more, more warming, more water vapour, more warming, more water vapour, and so we get these very strange uh, concepts of tipping points in the climate and runaway global warming. Now, if you looked at the, the actual way that the greenhouse effect worked, it's largely the back radiation from the atmosphere as against the, radio, the heat loss from the surface, which regulates the climate. And the back radiation from the atmosphere is always less, or the increase in back radiation is always less than the rate of increase of energy loss from the surface. Our, our planet is very stable. It will move a little in terms of its temperature, but it is essentially very stable. So these concepts of uh, tipping points and runaway global warming are quite foreign to, to the science that I know. Now, people talk about, uh, well, it's going to be two, three, four, even five, six degrees warming because of the doubling of carbon dioxide. There was a, the late Bill Priestley was the head of CSIRO's Division of Atmospheric Research. And he wrote a very nice little paper back in 1966. And it's called The Limitations of Temperature in Hot Climates by Evaporation. Now, I think we're all aware that the, the water temperature in the tropics may not get much more than about 30 degrees centigrade. But if you go to a tropical forest, it may get up to 35 degrees. You go out into the grasslands, it gets into the 40s. Go into the desert, Death Valley we were talking about the other day, 50 degrees. But the difference between <coughs> all of these temperatures is not the amount of solar radiation coming in. The essential difference is evaporation. We live on the, on the water planet. And so if you have a bit more carbon dioxide, it will raise the, the temperature a little bit. But because of the evaporation, that will regulate it all. And so I come to the conclusion that there's a lot of propaganda based on numerical uh, computer models. And the computer models are essentially black boxes. They've been formulated, they run, and they, people take the, the answer of what comes out the out other side. Very few people really understand how the computer models actually work. Different people put different components in. Now, over the last 10 years we've heard, well, the models have now got this in, they've got that in, they've got a a, biolog a, a biosphere, they've got a, a chemical cycle, they've got this and that. But they're all just little elements that have been added on. We don't know just how they're interacting and so forth. So what we've got is a, uh, a, um, a framework that's been built up <coughs> based specifically on computer models. If you go back to the basic physics, the sort of things that Bill Priestley was talking about back in the, the 1960s, one finds that it's evaporation which regulates all of this thing. The carbon dioxide will change a little bit, but it will not be tipping points. There will not be runaway global warming. We may, at the outset, get a degree warming for a double of carb doubling of carbon dioxide, but there's no way from basic physics. And so I will continue to maintain my views on climate change so long as the laws of basic physics that I was taught as a, at high school and university remain in force. And I don't think that there's no, very much chance of those basic laws of physics being overturned. However, there's a lot of chance that the computer models will be modified and <laughs> start to record, uh, become back closer to reality. But uh, the, the book has got a lot of information in. Fortunately, my science has been minimised. It's been answering the questions and the, the, the way that uh, Bob and, uh, and John have put it together, it's in a very readable form. I think uh, if you get the book and you look at the questions and the answers, you will come to a quite a different conclusion to if you just read the popular press and the, the, the announcements from the, uh, from the Climate Change Commission. Just, just to finalise, one of the things that's come out from the, uh, the Climate Commission very recently is about the hotter summers that we're about to have. Uh, lady from the uh, Northern Territory News 
she obviously got off the crocodile stories and was because the Climate Change Commission put out a, uh, uh, something about Alice Springs was going to be six degrees warmer by 2040. <laughs> now, if you go to the Australian records that are on the Bureau of Meteorology website, they have a section called Climate Change and they have time series graphs. Now, if you look at the time series gra graphs of maximum temperature for January, going back to 1910, you find that there's almost no change. If you look at the uh, time series graph for the minimum temperature for uh, July, you'll find there's quite a bit of warming. So, yes, there is climate change has been taking place, but it's not going to be that we're going to boil, we're going to have a lot more heat waves and so forth. It's going to be at the colder end getting warmer. So there's a lot of things about climate change that are happening, but it's hard to relate them to carbon dioxide. So I'll finish up there and pass you across to, to Stuart Franks. Thanks very much. Thank